They said that they often hadn't time for rest and only had time for killing. I shot him again and again until his 14 bullets had passed through his body. It doesn't go away. It's not one minute at a time. Don't, don't think about him. He posed no threat to anyone. And they were able to shoot him. He'd, been, he'd give his life, and Father Mum would give his life for just basically helping people. In any other society, they would be given the awards, they'd be heroes, but in this society where we lived in at that time was different. It can't be argued that uh, all of these soldiers acted on their own volition. It's their soldiers, they acted under orders, and those orders pertained over three days. Once a government hands over to the generals policy matters, then generals behave the way generals are trained to behave. I was born on uh, the 9th of November 1956 in the house that I'm still living in, in Balmorphy. My mother was uh, a Catholic Republican from Cross McLean in South Armagh, and my dad was uh, a Protestant, uh, a Presbyterian Unionist from a place called uh, Naklakram in South Derry. I was aware of the fact that my dad had fought in the British Army, was captured at Dunkirk, and had been a prisoner of war of Hitler in a place called Gdansk, uh, Danzig in the Polish corridor, and that he was liberated by the Russians from Stalag 17 in uh, early 1945. And then, growing up in Bolland Murphy, it was kind of like the edge of the city at that time. You know, the only other estate that was close to us was Turf Lodge. So we had spent a lot of our time in and around the mountains, up the Hallistown, and so on. So we used to spend some of the summer uh, collecting bomb firewood and going and cutting down trees and things like that. And on the morning that internment was introduced, my dad woke me up, says to me, internment's in. Well, there was a state of utter lawlessness amongst the British security forces, all kinds of security forces, uh, around the time of internment. There was the implementation of uh, a policy the British had first followed in the Boer War, uh, more than, uh, well, at that time, nearly a hundred years before, uh, of wide-scale incarceration of people without charge, without trial, without prospect of release. And uh, the double whammy was that heavily armed British security personnel were out on the streets killing people. I have taken this serious step solely for the protection of life and the security of property. At all times, I have consistently emphasized that it was not a step towards which I would be moved by any political clamor. It was a strange day because everybody was woken up early because that was the first day when the raids were going on. You know, the very first time it had happened. And uh, houses were being raided in every street, so obviously people were getting worked up about it. Um, and so we were up from about, I'd say about five o'clock in the morning, everybody was up wondering what in the hell was going on. And people were going outside their doors and they were being told to get back in, you know, by soldiers and all the rest of it. Um, it was a strange day, very strange day. There had been rumours about an internment for maybe a week or so before hand that internment was going to... It always struck me as a very, uh, very funny sort of phrase that internment was coming in, you know. Uh, and then we got word the, the day before the 9th of August that internment was coming in the next morning. And... Uh, so, you know, broadly speaking, the Republican community in Belfast was anticipating that uh, this would, would happen. And uh, I stayed in Springhill 
that night and was wakened by the bin lids and by, by women shouting internments in, internments in. Everybody with any sense knew that if you had troops coming in as an assault group, there was no point. Just let them come in and do their business. Uh, and they came in with a vengeance. Uh, and, you know, a lot of this is now uh, hindsight and having talked to people at that time in the months afterwards who had been active in the British Army in Aden and in other places. They set up a killing zone uh, and anybody who entered into that was shot. Uh, they, they, they moved into the, the area. I was in Glenning Road at the time. Uh, they moved into the area uh, and they just shot uh, anybody that was within their their range. I heard a couple of shots fired and I just basically said to everybody, get on the ground and stay still. Because I knew that was the hardest target to hit was anybody lying on the ground. The, the soldiers were firing from houses on the on the Spring Martin Road on the apex of the roof, the way the roof's up pitched, and they were there's only their head and their shoulders, and they were tracking me with their rifles. Uh, this was a family field here in the open ground, and it was over in this direction here that uh, I had been running across whenever I was hit. I was hit from that position. It was here at this field, at, at the rear of Springfield Park, that Father Mullen was shot. He'd been in his home about 150 yards away when word reached him that a man had been shot and wounded in the field. Father Mullen immediately left his house and rushed to the scene, braving a hail of crossfire as he did so. Waving a white handkerchief, he approached the wounded man. But as he did so, he was hit by a burst of automatic fire. He fell and began to crawl away, but was hit again. First aid men who'd seen the incident rushed forward to help him, but the gunfire continued. And an 18-year-old youth, Francis Reed, who'd also rushed to the scene, was shot through the head. He left me about 20 yards away from me with gunfire, and I heard him screaming, and I looked over my shoulder, and he was lying on the ground, doubled up. And then, short time after, there was more gunfire, and he seemed to be hit again. And the fellow beside him was hitting the foot. And almost immediately, the lad called Frank when he was lying beside me. As he just jerked up, and I looked at his face as he was coming down, and he was dead. He was dead instantly. I told my mother that he had been shot, but not dead, because I didn't know at that time that he was dead, because it was on the news, but do you believe what you hear on the news? At times, it's not true. Hopefully it, it wasn't true at that time, but it, it did end up that it was true. I got uh, our local doctor to come down and tell my mother because she would not have been able to, in case she wouldn't have been able to cope with it. So he told her and then she was unbelievably uh, overwhelmed over I don't know. One feels that uh, the tragedy of his death is something that some good could come from if the message of the manner of his dying were appreciated. He, he died in ministering to his people. Uh, he died uh, giving the benefit of the sacrament of the church uh, to somebody who was in need. Watch me carrying the child and then shot me when I had left the child down. The knew the priest was giving me the last rites and it was clear enough daylight. When he went when he went to phone in London, he was shot down. You could see clearly enough to shoot me and shoot him, they could see clearly enough that he was a priest. Was anybody able to shout to the soldiers that you had a priest who was wounded there? You know, could they, could anybody get this message across them? The soldiers down. The soldiers knew that there was the, the, the priest was injured because he, the, the soldiers shot him. The SLI, he had a mad powerful bang. The priest came from his stomach on his back.
and the late news, a new, a news bulletin came on and says uh, that a, a priest had been shot dead and a young man in the Baltimore area. And my mother turned around and says that uh, that uh, somebody's going to have a sore heart tomorrow. And uh, that was, was never, and I never thought no more about it. So the next day, I was I was just lying and I was I was off school, and uh, the next minute I heard this terrible banging at the door, a bang, bang, bang. I says, I wonder who's that? So I, I ran down the stairs. I thought it was my, I could see my father through the, the glass and the outside door. And I uh, see my father just, and, and two other men. And I thought he forgot his key or something, you know. So I went down and opened the door. And my father was in a terrible state. It was, it was, uh, it was just was terrible. And he said, I says, what's wrong? Daddy, what's wrong? And he says, Frank was shot. And he, he just nicely walked right past and he sat in the stairs. And I run over to him, I says, and I always remember saying this, I says, was he wounded, Daddy, was he wounded? He says, no, he was shot dead. We're talking about that, and that's why the, the bike was my brother, but he was also my friend, you know? Me and Frank went to the bars together, uh, we jumped together, we went to dancing together. There was one day we were working on the job, I said the old, the old graveyard, fixing the roof. And we looked over the graves, and there was a graveyard, a man died over a hundred years ago. And I let him that I know, and said a couple of weeks, our Frank would have been dead. On the night of the 9th of August, um, myself, my sister and my friends were standing watching Rant uh, at Henry Taggart Memorial Hall. And my mommy came along and told us we had to go home because there was going to be a curfew. Uh, put in place and we sort of kept her talking so that we could stay and watch her out. But then the loyalists attacked Springfield Park and all the riders seemed to head over in that direction. And I said, Mommy, come on, we'll go over and see what's going on. And she said, No, because the loyalists would shoot you, but the army won't. But the army then fired gas, uh, CS gas, and we could, I couldn't see her, so I said to my friend, come on, we'll, we'll run over and see what's going on. But when we got over, it, was, it looked a bit scary, and we got frightened, so we headed on down home. But my mummy never came home, and all night we sort of, with uh, curfew being on, and we were scared to go out and look for her. But the next morning my sister went out and looked for her, and couldn't find her anywhere. They checked all the community centres and that. So my brother told my daddy to phone the hospital and see was there anyone with red hair admitted to the hospital uh, injured and this, he came back. He was literally carried and it was horrendous. Uh, there was only one woman and she was in the morgue with red hair. Miss Joan Connolly had entered the field, the man's field, to, uh, to assist my brother who was already injured. So uh, subsequently they shot Miss Connolly. They shot her in the face and uh, she was going to aid my brother. So during that time, a sergeant came along by eyewitness told us. They got out of the sergeant and uh, my brother was kneeling and they shot him twice by any chair. My father, Tony Taggart, was in Springfield Park at about 8.30. He was trying to persuade his brother, Jared to go to my sister's house, Alice, and to safety. He lived beside the Henry Taggart Park, where the park chambers were billeted. The first shots in Springfield Park, my father and his brother Jared were split up. But my daddy went run down to be standing outside the park. Uh, and his brother Jared went back into the house when all of a sudden the park troopers opened up uh, without warning and started shooting into the crowd. My daddy ran behind a, a concrete pillar for safety. There's a bit of a little lull in the shooting. Himself and Noel Phillips and a couple of other men tried to run for safety, but he was brought down. He was shot in the leg first. It brought him down. Noel Phillips was brought down as well. He was shot in the leg. They ran into a field called the Old Man's to take cover. My daddy was hit in the right thigh. Desi says he heard him shouting, Desi, I'm hit. He spun around and fell. Um, Desi says he couldn't reach my daddy. Him and Davy Callahan tried to reach him to pull him in, but they couldn't because the fire was so intense. Um, 
So my daddy lay there, um, there was other people already shot in the field. Sh a short time later, um, an army vehicle drove into the field. And according to Daisy Crone, they put five people into the, into the field. Now while they were in the field, two of the, two of the soldiers were shooting at people that was in the field. Um, Desi Crone heard him saying, we've got five, kill the bastards. Each time going to Army Post, after I asked about my daddy and everything else, um, each time I was walking away, they started singing that song, Where's Your Papa Gone? Which was very hard to take. Uh, um, and I got very emotional, crying, crying my eyes out. But um, as I say, the last time going, after said it was an if non identified body, um, it was the exact same thing, just where's your papa? And I was singing that song, Where's Your Papa Gone? And I was 23 at the time. So I went to Lagan Bank Morgue and I identified my father only by his we take curly hair, which I had cut my daddy's hair early that mor the morning of interment. And um, that's the only way I could recognise my father because of the beating that I got for by being shot 14 times. It was really unrecognisable. Eddie walked from the flats behind St Aidan's School onto the, the main Upper Springfield Road. He turned and walked down past Kelly's Corner. Then he walked on the right-hand side, cemetery side, right down to where he was at. He then seen Billy Will. This is Billy Will took me before he died. And Eddie crossed over to speak to Billy. And his words partly to Billy were, how am I going to get down around this? I have to go to blah, blah, our ladies' hospital. And that's when he was sat in the back and he was talking to uh, Billy. When my father was first murdered, my mother and my aunts and all kept it from me. Um, trying to protect me because I was such a young child. We were just saying my dad was away. Uh, he was away working or he was away somewhere. I, I didn't know any different than my dad he was there. Until about a year, year and a half later, an army jeep drove up the street. And they were singing, where's your papa gone, where's your papa gone? And there was three of them laughing in the jeep, but there was one of them. And he was, had the hatred on his face. He actually scared me because it was a tale of the way he was behaving. He was screaming at me, I shot your daddy, and there was spit coming out of his mouth, and his veins were sticking out on his neck. We shot your daddy, I shot your dad, your dad's dead. And I remember going into the house and saying to my mum, is my daddy dead? And my mum was shocking my mum's face, and she went, how do you know that, son? And I said, she just says to her, the army's only out there coming up the street and telling me there was a soldier who told me he shot my daddy dead. Um. I think he was, I don't know, the soldier here he was. He's probably just took his frustration out in the crowd and just fired him indiscriminately. had rattled about half three, 25 to four, maybe around about that time. Um, the bin lids rattled and another brother woke Terry and John. They got dressed and they went out. Now in between that, John went first, followed shortly by Terry because, to be honest with you, my daddy and my mummy tried to stop them going out and um, what we do know is then that for some reason John ended up at it must have been near German Hill, that's where he was basically, that's overall we know where he was shot, we don't know anything in between. Well I was only nine uh, and we were out playing in the street because he had been missing for a couple of days and I remember my uncle Paddy coming down the street and getting into the house and when we went into the house it, it was 
um, my uncle Paddy, my uncle Paddy that told us that he was dead. Uh, he died 16 days after he was shot. And I just, I just remember walking into the house and hearing him saying that my daddy was dead. John was shot in the back. It was a flesh wound. It wouldn't have caused dam it, it did damage, but it wouldn't have caused um, death. But also then we did we found out that through his autopsy reports, because I could never, I've always believed that John was shot once until we started doing our own investigation. And John had another bullet wound to the thigh, which travelled up and damaged every vital organ that was in his young 20-year-old body. And this bullet, say, would have been, when he was shot, he would have been laying down. He posed no threat to anyone. And they were able to shoot him. Tell lies about him and get away with it basically. They got away with the murder. It was hard. I was nine. Um, my younger brother was only four months old, and there was another sister younger than me again. Um, there were seven of us all together, so it was hard. It was hard for my mummy. Uh, my daddy also he worked in shorts or craft factory, um, which 40 odd years ago you didn't really get Catholics working in. And his brother lived in Australia. So he, we were actually heading to Australia. We were getting all our injections. The, the, everybody in the house was all excited. We were moving and, and then that happened and we got nowhere. But not only did we go through that and did my mummy go through that and left with seven children to her, she got hate mail from Shorts that said, may your husband and his subhuman pals roast in hell. As, well, as it says, he had went to work to finish off some journey work. He stepped outside while the funeral came in, and that's when, don't know whether that, why they took a pot shot with him, because he, he had one arm. Um, maybe they'd realised the metal casing that he had on his arm to help him do his work. Maybe they thought that was a gun or that, but why stand outside a chapel watching a funeral if you're going to have a gun? you know, with soldiers all about. That that is my theory. But why I don't know why they uh shot at him. Cause even at the inquest they had told my mum that it was a sniper from Corey's yard that shot him. Cause even then they didn't wouldn't own up to the fact that it was a soldier had shot him. I suppose I, I knew about it at the time, but there was a lot going on at the time, you know. About four years ago, I got involved with the Billy Murphy families that came to a meeting up here in Stormont, where they were doing a presentation, and I heard their story at that time, and that was when I became fully aware of what had happened and decided to uh, make some inquiries into the matter. I feel that the, this, was part of, this was where everything went crazy, Basically, the army came in, and my perception was to protect the Catholics on the Falls Road from some of the incursions that were taking place, and from the the many that were burned out and around Connard and and, and and similar places. And in fact, in in time and in a very short time, they became very heavy-handed and attacked the broad community. Yes, there may have been people in the community uh, engaged and involved in paramilitary activity, but they didn't, they, they, that wasn't their focus. Their focus was just to punish the whole community. And their actions around the aftermath of internment were were very brutal. And, uh, you know, the, the people involved, the, the, the very high line one very quickly was the, the priest that was killed in terms of, of uh, 
trying to attend to someone that dying, that was totally unacceptable. So a lot of people at that stage, and even without getting a lot of information, people that I would have been in contact with were very quickly came to suspect the information, the official lines that were put out. This morning, the army was only guessing at the number who died. It's all they can do. Nobody really knows how many snipers were hit by army shots, and the soldiers are convinced that several dead snipers have yet to be recovered from where they lie at their firing points. There was no crossfire, there was no gun battle, there were the people who were killed uh, weren't, weren't caught up in, you know, armed actions between Republicans and the British Army. They were, they were killed by the British Army. In conflict zones throughout the world, they're often competing for the truth. Uh, that promoted by the state, um, and, and that of the families and the community who uh, suffered human rights abuses at the hands of the state. And in the struggle between these official versions and unofficial versions of the truth, the law and by extension the uh, criminal justice agencies are used by the state as a tool to deny what had happened. And that's exactly what happened in Ballamurphy. In 1970 there was an agreement between the, the British Army, the General Officer Command and the Chief Constable of the RUC whereby uh, when soldiers were being investigated uh, in, in relation to lethal force incidents, the interviews were carried out by the Royal Military Police, which usurped the responsibility of the police in relation to these incidents. Soldiers were not subject to the rigours of the law or weren't made accountable. In addition to that, the RUC made no attempt or no genuine attempt to trace all the witnesses and, and obtain witness statements in relation to these incidents. And what you had then was the outworking of that was flawed inquest. Um, the coroner was not cited on all the evidence and cr crucial evidence was withheld from him. He couldn't compel soldiers to come to the inquest. Soldiers were not cross-examined by the family's representatives. And the uh, jury or coroner could not come to uh, findings. There was simply a verdict. In these particular cases, um, which I would describe as RMP cases, um, they were the focus of uh, attention from a number of NGOs in 2007. Uh, some of the cases were completed by the HET, and one of them actually was a Balmurphy case, which I read, um, and was astonished at the uh, level of um, lack of investigation. It became apparent very quickly that there was a uh, there was a lack of a coherent legal strategy in the campaign, and I advised the families on a number of issues, including an application to the Attorney General to reopen the inquest and related civil proceedings against the Ministry of Defence and the RUC. A good example of evidence being withheld in the original corner is the case of, of Edward Daugherty, uh, who was shot dead on the 10th of August 1971. We have now obtained uh, various statements from Soldier B, who fired the fatal shot. In his original uh, statement to the Royal Military Police, uh, he stated that he had fired 30, he had emptied his cartridge of 30 rounds. And must have inadvertently engaged the chase lever, an automatic, I emptied this magazine firing towards the rifle. I had seen the, the man lean down and take a petrol bomb from a mineral crate standing in the road and light the fuse. As he was throwing it at me, I cocked my weapon, ensured that the change lever was in the single shot position and kicked open the left hand cab door. I leaned out of the cab and holding the weapon in my left hand, I sighted and fixed one shot at the man who had just thrown the petrol bomb. However, in the later statement to the coroner in 1972, he stated he had fired one aim shot at the deceased. Now that's an extraordinary omission uh, which was upheld, uh, withheld from the coroner in the original inquest. And on that basis, the Attorney General directed a fresh inquest into the death of Edward Daugherty. I just I knew my daddy was shot dead, so it changed my whole life as a child. I, want, I wanted, I was angry, I was growing up, I was wanting revenge, I was wanting everything. And I just failed to understand how the man that murdered my father made two different statements, two totally separate different statements, and both of them are lies. One saying my father was a Padra bomber, the other saying he was a gunman. They were both lies. My father, when he was found, had, hadn't got any gun residue, no petrol on his hands, no nothing. My father was a peace-loving man who was in the, 
who was like everyone else, he was going to a mercy deed for others. He was going to check if his sisters were all right because of the previous shootings in the area. As part of preparation for these fresh inquests, we have uh, traced witnesses. Uh, we have obtained witness statements. These witnesses were never asked to go to the previous inquest. In addition, we have engaged forensic and medical experts to re-examine, in particular, the autopsy reports which were uh, made at the time. Uh, one example of that is we, that we've engaged a uh, former emergency consultant in the Royal Victoria Hospital, uh, Dr Lawrence Rack, to uh, examine the, uh, the file of Joan Connolly. And he had concluded that um, Joan Connolly, if she had received medic adequate medical treatment at the time, she would have survived her injuries. So despite being shot, it is very clear that Joan Connolly, who was left lying in the field all night, uh, could have survived those injuries and could be alive today. So Ballamurphy just isn't about innocent civilians being shot dead. It's also about the torture uh, of local civilians. And it's also about the denial of medical treatment to seriously injured people. At the time, it was just horrendous because we had literally only been told that my mummy had been murdered, well, had been killed, and we didn't know where and what or what anything about it. We didn't know, just knew that it was pretty bad, and it was just, it was like an, a, a nightmare, like you just didn't know if it was real or not. And my daddy, if, I just remember uh, two of the neighbours carrying him in, and it was just, it's just the pain in his eyes, and he was just lost. And we were all sort of just so young. The youngest sister was only three years of age. Um, everybody was just screaming. She was getting frightened because we were all screaming. We were sent to uh, Cork first. It, um, it was like a big, massive refugee camp. It was like all these huts, and these seemed to me like thousands of people in it. And I remember standing at the door looking around me, and it was pitch black, and these rooms had all these beds in them. And you were just told that was your bed. And then the next morning we were all put in buses and people were sent to all different places. We were sent to Waterford till uh, an army camp where we stayed there. And I think it was about there a couple of days uh, when me and the sister was sitting, watching the TV, all the other children, all our kids were sleeping. And it came on the news to say that my mummy had just been buried that day. People honestly want their loved ones' names cleared. I mean, I think particularly of Joan Connolly, who was the mother of a family out trying to find food for her children's breakfast the following day. She wasn't engaged in paramilitary activity. And there were, she was just one. And they were all killed in equally, equally despicable circumstances. And uh, the British government's going to have to face up to this sooner or later. I regard the British Army as being my army. I, I, I like to be proud of them. I'm, I'm British. Uh, they, they operate around the world in various scenarios, such as Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere over the years, the Falklands. I, I would like to think that they would conduct themselves in, in a proper way, particularly when they're involved in, in civil duties rather than, than a war situation. It, it, it does look likely that in Bally Murphy, as in, in Derry, they didn't conduct themselves in an appropriate fashion. And I think we need, we need the truth of it. We need to find out what exactly happened. And the evidence would, would appear to be there. It just needs to be studied, sifted and uh, brought out. Nobody has a reason not to know. And if we can educate our young people to go searching for the truth, I think that they'll find it in a way now that they never were able to before. I see it every day, blame myself every day. Good day to can accept that I wouldn't do anything wrong. I was only helping somebody. But on a bad day, I would still say that I was responsible for their deaths. My actions caused them to be there to help me. When I was shot, they came to help me and they both lost their lives and they did that. They're covering it up because they know, they know that they murdered 11 innocent people in cold blood and they felt they got away with it. They didn't expect us as families, children, to grow up, come into adulthood and decide that we needed to know the truth. So then you end up with all sorts of, you know, 
arguments back and forth. But arguably, arguably, if there had been a proper holding to account of those who killed the people in Bella Murphy, then there wouldn't have been a bloody Sunday. And then there wouldn't have been the huge convulsion and the radicalization that went on in the relationships between people here and between these two islands. So there's only one trajectory comes out of that, and that is a, a continuing conflict. And that's the legacy of Bella Murphy. Arguably, even Bloody Sunday is part of the legacy of Bella Murphy.